Hello and welcome back to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally and today we are having a very special guest. He is a documentary filmmaker that is focusing on Ex Jehovah's Witnesses with his first project, but hopefully in the future, maybe some other things as well. I am very excited because he has an absolutely fascinating story quite literally spanning the entire globe. So I'm super happy. Uh, don't forget to drop a like on this video. It helps it get out to more people on YouTube. So make your little sacrifice to the algorithm gods. I'll give you a couple seconds. Do it now, right now. Click that, okay, you've done? Okay, cool. Now that that's taken care of, let's do this. So I have with me today, Scott. Homan. <laughs> Homan. <laughs> I didn't forget his last name. You forgot his last name because you actually didn't. How are you, my friend? Doing well. Thanks for having me on, Willie. Yes, uh, yes. I love your channel. Oh, well, uh, I'm sorry that you've suffered through any videos, but, uh, you know, there at least <laughs> is so a funny. few laughs. There's a few laughs to be had out there. So, uh, obviously, you're an ex Jehovah's Witness. What was sort of your story? What brought you into the organization? Like what kind of catapulted you into the world of the goofiness that is Watchtower? Oh, wow, okay. So the, the brief of it is my grandparents joined in their retirement and then their four children, including my, my dad, slowly joined with, while they were raising families or after they'd raised families, which is kind of a different path than normally. Most people raise their kids and then they raise their kids and so on and so on, cascades. This is sort of like in retirement and then like during raising kids. And then those mm -hmm. kids were sort of like, we had like a, all me and my cousins that were raised in it. We had a sort of normal upbringing for a few years. And mm -hmm. then there's this big transition where we got indoctrinated and went through the learn from the great teacher with headphones and a cassette tape and you push pause and you're like, read the question. And the answer is one of the three sentences in the childish paragraph, which is not much different than a washed hour. <laughs> were you cognizant of like at the time, the transition you were making in your life from being school, friends, whatever play to now we're sitting down listening to the audio tapes of learn from the great teacher. It was a very distinct transition. I was only six years old mm -hmm. when it started and I, I would be sat down instead of going and playing with my brother or playing with toys or watching cartoons or whatever, or reading books, it would be, okay, now you're going to sit in bed with a, a Walkman cassette player and you have this, I was like, fold He's aging himself here. Cassettes, definitely. <laughs> uh, cassettes and you put the tape in and you make sure it's rewound and you start at chapter one and then it like tells you and you have to listen, you have to pause it when there's a question and it's just very manual operating big mechanical buttons mm -hmm. and like reading the book and following along with the words of your finger. And then when it stops, like go to the question. And my dad was like teaching me how to use, how to do the question answer indoctrination. And I was like, this is not fun. How long do I have to do this? <laughs> this like yeah. protesting. And it was like right after having our last Christmas and like having a pile of gifts to our parents being like, now kids, this is your last Christmas. Wait, but don't really? worry. Don't worry. We're, you're going to still get gifts. It just will never be on this exact day. But you'll still get gifts throughout the year. Huh. Yeah. So even though, like, so he kind of knew he was going to transition to being a Jehovah's Witness, but still something in his mind said, hey, I want to make sure they have this last Christmas, even though something he kind of must have known it was wrong to say it would be your last one, <laughs> right? I think, yeah. Well, I think that was my mom's pressure because she mm -hmm. loved the holidays and she never really joined the religion, was very reluctant. She still hasn't actually joined the religion, but now she like, she, she goes, she's been going for like 30 some years, um, like puts up with it basically. Um, so it's her last Christmas, I guess. And we got gifts with, that were all wrapped up and we celebrated in that in some simple way. Had little watchtower wrapping paper on it, jw.org. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's a funny thing because we were like the new family, right? Like imagine like going, having a Bible study in your congregation and everyone's love bombing them. Yeah. And my parents, I mean, my mom like sort of milked that, I think, because she never wanted to do any of the things. She barely went and mm -hmm. she didn't want to join the school, the theocratic ministry school. And she never wanted to go preaching. I don't think I, she, I, one time I remember her going and it was like, never again. She's like, that sucked. I will never do that again. So we had this sort of like protest, silent protest and sort of like a resistance person as one of our role models throughout our lives. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that, that probably created a slightly healthy dynamic between yeah, your dad I think, and your mom. 
yeah i think that that was really good for us kids to have sort of two different perspectives mm -hmm. and then the only like the main family we had with cousins and extended family all were living at our hometown where my mom's side of the family who are all lutherans and non-denominational christians mm -hmm. or just like non-active but generally believed in god or something that wasn't like a focus of their life so like you know when you hear oh like the end of the world is coming and jesus is going to come back and murder everyone who's not a jehovah's witness like we don't want that to happen but it's going to happen and we kind of want their houses it's like well oh. that's my cousin's house you know like oh, that's why the would worst. you the houses <laughs> you <know? laughs> Uh, I don't really, I think it's really weird. Like, I really love my cousins. I don't want Jesus to murder them. And like, dad's like, eh, you know, change the subject. My dad and my, we never did like real family study ever. Our family study consisted of when we started doing it, it was like, well, you should underline your watchtower before the meeting. Like, while eating breakfast, everyone quick, do the thing as fast as you possibly can. So it looks like you studied. The like Zorro study. The yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. At least underline a word in a paragraph and then you can move on. Um, that happened when we were teenagers, like way later. And we didn't have to go in service. And my dad's like, well, I really want you to. But my mom's like, I'm watching cartoons. <laughs> like, okay. I want to hang out with mom. <laughs> and that She's was pretty consistent, ideas. like through into your teenage years. Like you yeah. didn't have to go like hardcore in it. Yeah, pretty much. There was, I mean, dad would always pressure us and, in some way, but it was always like, I'm not going to force you to do anything. I want you to like want to do it or think it's important, which is kind of, it was kind of balanced. Yeah. He was even balanced with music. Like later on when we were teenagers, he sat us down. He's like, I know a lot of people in this, in the meetings or at the Jehovah's Witness church, they will go through their kids' music collections and throw things away and yell at them for having, you know, a swear word or mm -hmm. having explicit lyrics, but I'm not going to do that, but I want you to self police. Basically. He didn't say those mm -hmm. words, but he's basically like, I want you to decide what you think is right. And what does you think is wrong? Make your own decision. And he's like, I won't ever go through your collection. And he had this like 40 LP full length record set with a record player that we listened to our whole lives. And he's like, I'm not getting rid of that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and awesome. It's like filled with heavy, like heavy rock and roll and stuff from the seventies. That so like, I feel like he was pretty balanced in a, in a lot of ways as well. That probably to, give to, his, to his credit was like building the foundation for you almost leaving the organization because it sounds like, hey, you don't have to go so far to where you're believing every single thing. Like you're still able to make some type of choices even within the Jehovah's Witness paradigm. And I yeah, mean, maybe that was balanced with your mom, but even your dad seems like he was a, a bit balanced. So. Yeah, I think that they were sort of, I guess the Jehovah's Witness term would be use your, it's a conscience matter, so use your conscience. We don't, we don't use Jehovah's Witness terms here. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm actually happy to hear that. That's something I'm trying to never do again, and I encourage people not to use that language. Yes. Um, people of the internet, stop it. Get some help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're not doing okay, that. Okay, so no more Jehovah's Witness terminology. Yeah, yeah. We, we, get can... to, we get to call it a church now or a cult. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. That's fine. Cool. I like the goofy goobers as well. That one's a good one. <laughs> so when were you like baptized? Did you, because like, I mean, generally, even if you are pretty balanced, everyone that I've ever known that has been associated with the witnesses goes through like their edgy teenager phase or some sort of phase where they're like i really want to be a jehovah's witness like hardcore did you have that phase in your life there was a moment where i was hanging out with my peers including my brother who were in the religion friends in the religion and i had taken i think it was alkaline trio album i had all the alkaline trio they're like a chicago punk band i guess and i really like them but they have all these songs and at some point i think i was actually it wasn't until i was in my like early 20s like 2021 okay is when i actually 21 is when i like started okay i'm gonna try to take it seriously and follow the rules and just see how that feels i've never done that mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I went through all my alkaline trio collection for some reason that band and then we were on some road trip and i had i'd gone through the whole thing listening to every single song and i was like okay i'll delete not delete the song but like i'll move it to a different folder like a to delete in the future this, folder. I did the same thing. <laughs> I did the exact same thing. I'm like, I don't want to delete it, but I'll just put it over here for now. Yeah. It's like in the buffer zone. It's like it's in purgatory. <laughs> um, and I, I just removed all the songs from the playlist that we were listening to. Like maybe I like make like an MP3 mix on a disc for like a road trip. Also dating myself. Yeah. And it was like, it's Alkaline Trio thing I just put together. And my brother's like, why didn't you have any of the good songs on here? Well, I was, I was like, well, I removed, removed any song that didn't have a swear. I removed every song that had a swear word. He's like, 
seriously we never you've never cared about that no like those are their best songs who cares mm -hmm. if they say the word you don't have to repeat the word it's like not like i don't know whatever so that was that was a whole thing and i was like maybe he's right like i went really overboard there and i moved songs to a different folder on my computer for no reason <laughs> <laughs> just so you're like well i'll put this over here i remember i did that that exact same thing and then it only lasted maybe like six months or something and then i was like this is so monumentally stupid and mm -hmm. i just I mean, words are words. They're not actions, and they're not hurting anyone. So, yeah, yeah. I kind of sorted that out in my little sixteen-year-old, seventeen-year-old brain. Yeah, I think um, our parents sort of raised us where like a double life was the only way that was normal. What would what Jehovah's Witnesses? Okay, that's another Jehovah's Witness term. What they would call like someone fo not following all the rules, who's like maybe following the rules in person in front of other people, but then when their other Jehovah's Witnesses aren't around, then they do their normal life or the way they mm -hmm. want to act or something or break some rules or small rules or something. And that was, we were always doing that. Like all of me, my little brother, especially all of our friends, even my older brother, who's take really later took this, the religion really seriously. We all only had friends who are not, were not in this religion what because there were exactly no peers. When you say like they basically forced you to live a double life, like that's kind of interesting. Not forced, but like that wasn't, there wasn't, I didn't ever see, I didn't have examples of people living according to what the watchtower taught. Like there's obviously like the examples in the watchtower, like extreme human beings wearing polos and khakis. Like that's how they're depicted. And they're, you know, the most boring people possible, the most vanilla human beings. Yeah. And we were in a rock band since we were like 14 years old and like loved Nirvana. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a rock God, like Nirvana. And we, every Weezer album was amazing. And just like, all the all the musicians that were into that music, they kept all their instruments at this house, our next door neighbor's house. Like he died and my parents bought it and it turned into like a music studio. Oh, from wow. like 16 years old in high school, my brother's four years younger. So from 16, we, he was 12 on, we had like a whole house as a music studio and like all of our friends from our town and county basically like kept their instruments there, bass, guitar, all the amps. I had, a, we had a drum set, we had an organ. Um, we had a whole like PA mic and drum mic kit and like a, recording setup and we just recorded music and played music all the time we threw parties there non-witness related parties later in my 20s i moved back there i moved I left for like a while i came back there and kind of took this religion more seriously mm -hmm. and then we started doing that same thing but with witnesses and we started meeting like people within like a three-hour radius because wisconsin's super rural so like three hours is like the next town over yeah and there's like someone interesting three hours away and like they'll drive down with their cello and like their i don't know their other guitar and play music with us and like we throw like a little micro concert with like 14 little artists and like there's 30 people hanging out like that a house is, party that is incredible like that i've never heard of anything like that before where it was on such a big scale like you know me and some of my friends you know we can get together play music or whatever but it was like pretty low level stuff and like there was some people that i know that like actually played a few shows and things, but nothing on the scale of like, hey, underground music scene. Yeah, it was really interesting. It was very fledgling, like just kind of starting out and we were kind of just all meeting each other and it was very exciting and we're all horny and we're like, mm -hmm. it's like another way of like meeting people you want on a date and everyone's getting interested in each other. Yeah. But people were driving up from Chicago to hang out with us and it's like a four hour drive. Damn. And like, then we would go down there. We played music in Chicago once or twice. We went to some house party there with like two other bands that were playing. Mm -hmm. And there was this whole other Chicago scene. And then like at that same time, I also learned of this music scene in Minneapolis, which was way bigger, like 500 kids who were like either in bands or making music or like fans of the bands and like groupies. 500? And it was all, it, it's, it was huge. Wow. Yeah, it was huge. And so that's what the film is actually like about the movie that I made. Mm -hmm. not, to, not to segue into it, but we can. But it was, it's called Nuclear Gopher and there was this website. So like, this is, we're talking like late nineties. This is already, this has been happening for a decade in Minneapolis already. And when I discovered it, it was like year 2001 and I ended up going there to see Jehovah's Witness band like concerts in some public cafes that were open to the public, but there's like the whole crowd is like filled with young teenage witnesses, early 20 somethings. And there's like four bl bands playing a set and they've been doing this for years and they, the new album just came out and I was buying like, like Jehovah's Witness records, you know, like pressed CDs That's and tapes. And it was the coolest thing. And I was like, oh, 
I didn't realize, I thought we were just doing that in Wisconsin in like our own little bubble. And it was sort of like everyone put up with it because we have no, no outlets at all. There's absolutely nothing to do except for going bowling. And like, I, <laughs> I, I have absolutely never need to go fucking bowling for the rest of my life because <laughs> I bowled so much. It's like a sport in Wisconsin. Oh, man, <laughs> Every town true. has a bowl. It's like a class you can pass. I know. You get a like, grade on. You can play basketball, <laughs> go bowling, <laughs> and do music. And that's about yeah. it. As long as you do right. a couple Kingdom Melodies in there, you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> was the, yeah, like, was the music the metal there? version of one of the Kingdom Melodies or something? Let's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obey and be blessed. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so horrible. Was like the molesting tone... bees. <laughs> God, the molesting <laughs> bees. I was so happy when they changed that lyric. It was the worst. Was the uh, overall tone of the music though? Um, like, did it have any sort of religious, like, s- lyrics to it? Any of like the themes or the motifs? Were they about like God or paradise or anything like that? Or was it mostly? like real punk music that was talking about how depressing and horrible it is to be a Jehovah's Witness. And that was an outlet <laughs> or an expression of that. It's interesting because both of those questions are great. And you would think that those themes would come up yeah. in that type of society because punk usually represents like a resistance culture speaking out about something. Mm-hmm. And, or they're religious. So like, well, we can get away with it as long as we're talking about God. And neither of those things ever happened from my experience in any of the communities that was in, I was introduced to. Hmm. And there were some as well I learned recently, and I also experienced it a little bit when I lived in Washington, where you're at. There was another music scene out there. And also a guy from Portland, I think, wrote me and was like, hey, there was a scene out here you should, you should like reach into. Like I, I made a ton of music with friends out here. And it was the thing. There was actually some cross-pollination between Minneapolis and the West Coast in the Jehovah's Witness space. But yeah, the, it was all totally secular music, Mm-hmm. almost always about relationships okay. and like what teenagers are thinking about, which is, you know, I'm in love or like, mm-hmm. Oh, she broke my heart and I'm angry about it. And it Urr. sucks. Urr. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's angst. Angst just for the sake of being a teenager and not knowing how to express yourself or like w- deal with the world. But uh, at least, I mean, those witnesses that experienced that, and I imagine a lot of them ended up leaving the organization too. They had a way to express it because the biggest like fear I have is when people don't have any way to, they don't have an outlet for some of the anxiety and stuff that builds up when you're in the organization. And then you're like, it kind of kills you inside. Yeah. And I think that for a lot of the musicians, it was this sort of fun, vibrant scene that was healthy. Yeah. Or maybe the healthiest, as one person in the film says, the healthiest that you could be, in that kind of culture mm-hmm. was a, like having some kind of outlet where you could like have bonds that were beyond just, we read the same magazine on Sundays and we answer the right questions and everyone thinks we're awesome because we raise our hand. Like yeah. that's not really a bond that's emotional, but like music is like, I put my heart and soul into this song. It took me like three months to like write this melody and then I put these words to it. And now I'm singing it publicly and I'm like putting myself out there in this vulnerable way. And someone else is like, I love that check out what I made and then they're like, oh, let's work on something together and they make this other thing together. Like that's a much bigger, stronger emotional bond that's like probably even pre-language. You know, it's like a deep human experience or animal experience, like beat on beat on drums together around a fire, you know. I'm not really into way. the the metaphysical or supernatural world, but I do like envision a scenario where you when you're connecting with someone else, there's some type of like vibration or frequency that you guys are operating at and when those two things get in sync it's like this beautiful moment and you can like really feel it inside and music and poetry are like wonderful ways of actually finding someone else's frequency if that makes any sense i know all of the people I think, are like i thought wally was a hardcore atheist and really it's like that was out here talking about frequencies but do you know what i mean Honestly, I think, it, I mean, you're saying it in a more philosophical or deeper way, but on a practical sense, that is exactly what's happening with sound waves. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, I'm going to emote at a, this tone. And like, if you emote in harmony with that or mm-hmm. an octave off or, or something in complete, in completely on the same note, then we can do that for, you know, four beats and then we'll change the note and we'll do that other note together. And it's like, now you're like playing this, riding these waves at the same time where it's very, it's an act of presence. Mm-hmm. But like almost no one knows how to do. And it's like speaking a whole different language yeah. that's completely different than like just the words of our English language. It's like something deeper. Yeah. 
It's like analog. That. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So we'll circle back to the the documentary and more about maybe the music scene. But where uh, where did your personal journey go? So you kind of left for a little bit in your teenage years, and then you came back to live with your parents in your early twenties. You said, where did you kind of end up from there? Early twenties, I went back. Kind of, I'd left the religion for like six months. Read some literature and was disillusioned by it, and didn't go. Live with some friends, some women in Madison, Wisconsin in the college days and got some job at a cafe. And then I like went back to the religion and I had this big hard heart with my dad. And he's like, you don't have to think about what the religion teaches or what the culture of the religion does or the people. Don't worry about the people or what they say or any of the drama, just you and God. That's it. Just you just focus on you and God. And then you'll get into the paradise. That's the system, which is almost like this simplistic version of Christianity. It's like Christian light. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I don't believe a lot of it. He's like, well, you know, if you go, if you start auxiliary pioneering, I'll give you half price rent. And I'm like, so if I work for 50 hours a month, I save $125 on the $250 rent. <laughs> or if I just write it's a bad 50, deal, if I just write 50 on a piece of paper, <laughs> right? Exactly. I just game the system. <laughs> That's true. I wish I was a bit smarter. But I, I was like, I, well, I'm only going to preach to atheists because they're the only people I respect. <laughs> <laughs> which is what I did for like eight months. I did like very pioneered. I saved $125 a month, <laughs> just the worst deal ever. Yeah. It's like slave labor. And then learned a lot about atheism and read a lot of books about science and physics. Met all these Jehovah's Witness musicians and was sort of on this path where I was, but at that time I was in a band with my high school friends. We'd mm -hmm. been playing music for years and I was living in the music studio. It was like, that was yeah. my house now before it was just a practice space. And then at some point, I was sort of like tired of the band and getting a lot of pressure from the new group of elders because the CEO had wiped out all of our elders that we kind of grew up with in one fell swoop. What year like was that? Like new. 2000. 2000. I remember there was like a... Like 2001. Between like 2000 and like 2005, there was like a cleaning of house of elders and stuff. So mm. a lot of ministerial servants and elders all just got wiped out. Interesting. Like That checks out. That makes sense. It wasn't just like a one per, one area thing or one congregation thing. It's probably a systemic change that they wanted to make. Yeah, I remember in my congregation there was I think four out of the eight elders got removed, and wow. I think eight out of like the twenty ministerial servants all got removed, just because they were all kind of like clowning around and were cheating on their wives, and it was just like kind of a party group and stuff so they just kind of really got and those were the one. days yeah i know that was one it was like <laughs> yeehaw jehovah's witnesses social structure Sounds like a good time Woo -woo -woo -woo. <laughs> <laughs> now it's all dark days are here <laughs> men live in fear i will have da -da 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 -da. no sorrow but some cash i'll borrow <laughs> god damn Wars. anyway sorry we digress a little bit oh speaking of like sampling Jehovah's Witness music and lyrics. You need to check out and plug in a friend, David Quesada. He run he has a band called The Bloody Tuesdays. Okay. All th the first two albums are like just pure samples and like I don't know, remixes of old okay. Jehovah's Witness stuff into like the funniest, coolest, weirdest it's like psych rock. Huh. Futuristic psych rock and all the album art is like super ripped out of the Revelation book. It's awesome. Damn. That sounds <laughs> like early cloud cult or something. I don't know. It's dope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll yeah, put a link to that in the description, and I'll probably put <laughs> something on the screen here that shows what the <laughs> album looks like, so you know what you're looking cool. for. I'm pretty sure he samples, or he does like a remix of Dark Days Are Here, or like some sample of it, so it's a good reminder. Yeah. But I'm like in the religion, doing the thing with my high school band. We're like playing shows. We make a new album, and while I'm like ox pioneering on the regular, and the elders are like, you shouldn't be doing that. Like, they have swear words in that album. And I was like... Jesus, everyone says that's a problem. It's like not really a big problem. And then they like convinced me to like not perform on songs that had swear words. And I was like, there's only one. Am I really going to make this choice in front of my like old time friends I've known for like six years and I make art with for all these years? We played, we played prom together. Mm -hmm. Like people were like smoking weed and doing acid. <laughs> and we were like the like dirty pug band in like our, you know, prom outfits <laughs> in the bottom of like a log mansion yeah it's awesome anyway so i did i did all this weird jehovah's witness stuff with my band and i was like also a little bit tired of like that music and it wasn't mine i was sort of mm -hmm. following we were called the clones and we always made the joke like the leader kyle 
just wanted to have clones of himself. So he made us learn how to play every instrument that he, the way he would play it. Oh, and it was okay. just sort of like, I felt a little bit uninspired by that position and I wasn't that into it. I love those guys. They're still good friends. Um, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to break out and do all these lyrics and songs I've been writing and working on for all these years. So I asked Kyle, who is a drummer and guitarist and singer. He did everything. I was like, can you help me produce this album in the studio at my place? So we did a one weekend tracking and he, he like basically produced all my songs. He like helped me structure them into like real proper songs. And we recorded them all on a track cassette with his proper like task cam a track. And he knows how to mix everything. He's been doing it forever. And like created an album and it's called, it was called the project was called ADD Chronicles. Cause I just assumed I had ADD just because like everything I heard about, it, I was like, yeah, the tracks I, I definitely can't pay attention and I'm lose focus, but I also like get straight A's <laughs> somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely like some strange thing. I don't know if I have ADD, but still, I've never been diagnosed, but whatever. I, I embraced it. I was like, fuck it. I'm, I have ADD. I'm just owning it in my music. And this is, and it was like eight or no, 10 songs of just like songs about girls that I liked in high school. Fair enough. <laughs> None of them are witnesses. And I only wrote poetry and like, like cute things about them or like a little bit of drama. Um, especially That's so about actually home. wholesome, probably to look back on. You're like, man, I was such a wholesome yeah. guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Talking about making out on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> that was the spiciest <laughs> thing that you had. I was making out like on the bridge. one one woman went to Colorado, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna. Are you gonna miss your cats? Like I like stupid lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> That's super cute. <laughs> yeah, so it's like this weird time capsule of just like being a teenager and like being a little bit like crushing on someone. That's like mostly what it is. Hmm. But there's a couple of cool like riffs in there that I'm really still stoked on. I think that was like a cool, it's a cool time capsule. Like I wrote a bunch of cool music yeah. and a bunch of weird lyrics and it's just like a teenager stuff, but it was fun. For and sure. it kind of came out as like a fuzz, fuzzed out alternative rock with a little bit of like skate punk influence, but not too much. Okay. It has like rock and roll drums because Kyle was my drummer mm -hmm. and that's what he does. And it, he, he rocked the hell out of those songs more than I ever would have done yeah. if I had like had someone play them the way I imagined it. Mm -hmm. Like I liked what he did with it. It's a cool little thing. Yeah. And it's on SoundClick, which is a weird website that still exists. SoundClick? Uh, I've never actually heard of SoundClick before. Yeah. Weird, weirdly, one of the guys whose music's in my film, um, Val Joe, Valentine Reedman, his song, his group is called The Blue Skies. And his, he put his music on SoundClick, and it's still there as well. So you can find both our ADD Chronicles and, and Blue Skies from Jehovah's Witness Music on SoundClick.com to this day. Old school. <laughs> you, get, you get some Jehovah's Witness music and a virus. Yeehaw. <laughs> joking yeah. about the virus <laughs> so then uh, you kind of go back have this weird time where you make music you're trying to kind of sort of, you said you were in oh. university as well right okay so i i do the music thing and then i'm like well i should if i can't i'm not gonna the witnesses don't want me to be in a a, a, a band that's not in the religion i'm not gonna say the word I mean, it's not the religion. So I'm going to form my own band in the religion with all these interesting witnesses I've met while I've been like doing all this like yeah. exorcist pioneering stuff, exactly. going to all these different congregations. And I was like, well, you play guitar. We should hang out. You like cool music. We should hang out. And then started forming these like, oh, I've met all the cool fringy kids in the religion and within like an hour and a half or two hour radius. So they would drive in and we'd do practices. We'd stay a whole weekend and just like make music and throw little parties and we'd perform and have all these witnesses come, all these pioneers coming over with like some chaperones. And but we'd like rock out so in front of them. so popular. Yeah. <laughs> Actually throwing fun parties. Imagine that cool. as a witness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. We had like four wheeler and we could make huge bonfires, like a trailer filled with pallets from some warehouse. It's like lighted up with gasoline and like everyone's outside in the winter with this massive mega fire and there's mute, live music playing in the house. It was fun. Middle Good America, y'all. Middle America. <laughs> if y'all are not from the United States, you wouldn't quite understand, but this is what, this is what entertains them. We got a four-wheeler right. with some pallets and some gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> and the fire is like as big as your truck. You know? It's like, <laughs> holy shit. And then, you know, if you stay long enough, we go get the guns and then we go yep. like, shooting trees down with bullets. And it was, again, wild times. Middle America. <laughs> <laughs> this is what actually um, happens in yeah. all walks of life. So that happened, and we started playing all these like Jehovah's Witness like graduation parties because everyone's like getting out of high school, and and we're quite a multi age like six year span group mm -hmm. of people, and it started going pretty far. And then I sort of like needed to move on, and I ended up getting a job in Minneapolis, and a lot of those same friends in Central Wisconsin that moved into Green Bay, and then eventually other places, and a lot of them hooked up and got married, 
and um, like some people left, some people stayed in, but it was it was a, it was a very rocky time as any anyone at nineteen to twenty three years old. It's yeah. like who knows what's gonna happen whether you're in a religion or not. Like you're probably gonna change how you live your life yeah. pretty quickly. And what was cool for me is I discovered the music scene in Minneapolis. I got this job there, and I kind of I was sort of like tired of music, and I sort of was I felt like it was going nowhere. So I actually sold almost all my equipment while I was meeting all these musicians in Minneapolis, and I found them to be like. They didn't really accept me mm. in the religion because I was sort of like, they're like, wait, you were in a music scene in high school with like people who weren't witnesses. Like, mm. I mean, yeah, I did that for like five, four years before I like met witnesses who played music. So I thought that was cool that witnesses also were artistic. I didn't mm. know that. So I, I've, I'm discovering that. So I'm like, now I'm like, I'm playing, I'm sort of like for them, I'm like super fringy. But for me, it's like the most religious I've ever been. And I'm sort of embracing the cool Jehovah's Witnesses in the city. And they're like, we can't trust this guy because he's not trying to become a ministerial servant and be a rock star. Like, I was like, oh, that's a weird double standard. You don't have to try to rise up in the religion to also be creative. You can just be creative mm -hmm. and do the minimum, do the bare minimum, like a normal person. Like, why would you work so hard to be able to play rock and roll <laughs> or like punk music? Yeah, or whatever. that's an interesting like duplicity that existed there. Like as you were trying to be more religious, it meant hanging out with people that you actually enjoyed being around, which meant you were around the scene. But then you go to a different place that's not in that scene, and everyone's like sneering and looking at you like, ew, you were in a rock band? Ew. Right. Yeah, it's very strange. Lots of double standards and pretentiousness and like gatekeeping. Like you can't be in our group. You can't play music with us because you, yeah, whatever. You haven't been approved by the elders to be a rock band. <laughs> what did that do for your like uh, religiosity then? Um, I was pretty disillusioned by it all. I was, you know, still, I was just like attracted to people who would be real with me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find that in the music scene that much. I started finding a few people, including especially Eric Elvendahl, who's featured quite a bit in my movie. He was deeply like in the music scene and he was playing in almost every band and producing a lot of albums and super, super talented guy. And that's probably my biggest tie to that scene was Eric. And also one thing that he was really special about him was when I when the whole scene was kind of dissolving mm -hmm. for lots of different reasons. Like one of the key people from the scene left the religion, mm -hmm. and another person. Well, I don't want to give away the spoilers of the movie because yeah. it's all about this moment. But someone got out of the religion, but he was like writing stuff on the internet. Ooh, like yo, you're not supposed to write things about on the internet. You're not even supposed to use the internet. <laughs> like you have to do that in secret. <laughs> But he was writing this blog and people were reading it, but they weren't telling anyone, but like they were filtering. Each of them were like getting influenced by this blog and then like filtering those ideas individually to other people, including me. And like I was still in the religion, but I was very open. Like Eric recognized me as a very open minded person because mm -hmm. I like, basically came, I was basically half, you know, not a witness in his, you know, in their, that community's mind. Yeah. So he would like, he's like, have you ever thought about this thing? And he would talk about something about evolution or, the flood and like oh yeah i mean i have but like not in that terms i haven't actually thought about like how did the koala bear swim to australia like not just one of them but like at least two yeah. at least the only two swam across the entire indian ocean mm -hmm. and they took enough food with them or like they had enough like well how Cut wait how, what are the dynamics of this <laughs> Did they ride a dolphin? Did the dolphins survive on the ark? What exactly was going on? I really like um, that anime version <laughs> where there's a koala bear riding a dolphin. Just like eating some smoked salmon. <laughs> like, is there a kelp forest? The you notion know, that like, koala bears can actually eat kelp? I, I don't actually know their dietary restrictions. Just going down into the kelp forest and grabbing handfuls. Hey, anything's possible with Jehovah, am I right? <laughs> am I right or am I right? <laughs> oh, my Lord. So once you start thinking about the actual dynamics of how this, how the world's animals would have propagated the planet with new life af on a dead planet after this global catastrophe, that's just, that's just one species. Mm -hmm. And there was, like, nothing left, maybe seeds and, like, two ostriches mm -hmm. and, like, two kiwis who can't even fly, like, little rat birds that, like... You know, like there's a lot of like unique examples of things that would be impossible, especially the Australian ex ecosystems, yep. like really distinctly interesting as an island. So far from everything. Um, 
And so I started like just pondering that thought and it wasn't the first and la it wasn't the last one. And he was like, basically hadn't gone to meetings in like months and months, like nine months or something, but we, he'd still party with us. Mm -hmm. And like, he was just sort of like bridging the gap and like talking to that guy, talking to us and like in the world and just like really treated people like they were friends and didn't like mm -hmm. hold back. And was really thoughtful about how he transition, transmitted knowledge or ideas in a way that was constructive, not like condemning or like a lot of people leave the religion and they're like, you're all a bunch of idiots. Like, yeah, like me. this is so obvious. I learned 14 things by when one, one hour of Google searching that would like destroy my like entire worldview. And you, you it should destroy yours too for the, and I'm going to make you feel like an idiot while I tell you. And like, yeah. that's not helpful. Cause I felt like it, it was nice to have someone who had just sort of left or was leaving to like, Hey, like I'm reaching back in to like communicate with people I love. And that was really impactful. And then I went to, I was just, then there was like a bunch of social stuff happened that dissolved my like friend community there for me. And I left and went to Florida with it. And I was like, okay, if this religion has anything to offer, it was never, there's nothing positive about becoming an elder or a ministerial servant. Nope. I hate that. Bethel sounds like a terrible time working in a factory as a slave. That sounds awful. Um, no, I don't care about the social clout you get from it. It's like a terrible time the whole time. I never want to do any of those things. Except for I do want to travel a lot and I haven't taken those opportunities and I would like to go on an adventure and be going abroad and staying in the witness community is interesting. Is it better? Is it is it fulfilling? I don't know, but I'd like to try it because I at least mm -hmm. like the adventure part of it. So then I went to Florida for a bit because my brother was there and I could work for his company for a bit and with the goal of going to Latin America. So I was learning Spanish the whole time, Went to eventually went to Ecuador okay, and did kind of like DIY need greater. Yeah. Like, well, you have to get you have to get approval from your congregation. And I was like, you actually don't send cards. You want me to you want to move pieces of paper from one building to another? Pa like, yeah. what do they say? They're like, well, it's private information. I'm like, it's my life that it's the record is of. Like, no, I'm not going to move cards. I'm like, well, you're never going to get approved to go to like Latin America to become a need creator. And I was like, how long would it take for me to be approved if I moved these pieces of paper for your pleasure? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I mean, probably you know two years i was like you can buy a plane ticket tomorrow you know how easy it is to go to ecuador or yeah. any country uh -huh. it's and just connect a couple with days and uh, yeah i can go meet people and they're like well that's not jehovah's path and i'm like well jehovah's path is fucking boring and slow and it's bureaucratic i hate bureaucrats more than anything <laughs> so true though two years to move a car what <laughs> what do I have to do for two years? I have to like give a bunch of dumb talks about stuff I don't believe. Like it sucks. Yeah. Um, that is. So I went down there and I was like, oh, cool. There's like people partying. There's all these pioneers who are like partying on the beach on the Pacific Ocean. They live on the Pacific Ocean and they're surfers. And they invited me down at like the convention. I remember oh, distinctly okay. the talk at the assembly. Some, so one of the, one of the governing body was there actually. He was like, can feel the spirit when you flip through the pages of the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit is right here with us. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, there's a cool party happening. I'm, I'm like way more interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a 20 something trying to surf and party and here this old <laughs> fart is talking about feeling the Holy Spirit as you go through the pages Whoosh. of the Bible. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my god they don't really appeal to young people do they at all it's dirt yeah, cheap to live there i don't have to like worry about like work and money and everything and i get to just and I was, a daily adventure exactly and i was pretty burnt out on the whole auxiliary pioneering thing and i'd like done it once or twice in minneapolis over the few years i was there and i was a bit burnt out on like witness culture and all the drama mm -hmm. and this was like filled with 70 hour plus pioneers who like someone at home is paying their way to be there yep. and I was like, I think I'm going to do double what I do in the USA, 20 hours. <laughs> but I'm not answering in the Kingdom Hall. I'm not going to be doing any of the, like, becoming a ministerial servant nonsense. I'm mm -hmm. just going to go to the volcanoes in the high Andes every couple of weeks for, like, a couple nights and stay in a hostel. And I'm going to learn to surf. And I just did that for five months, and it was awesome. Nice. <laughs> it was so good. I got so much shit for, like, not preaching for 50 hours a month or more, or not 70 hours, or trying to become a pioneer, or not, like, showing myself as an example. Like, white people need to answer more than the locals. That's how we do it here, where it's a hierarchical oh, structure where we know everything because we're our high school education is way better than, like, we're way more educated with, like, at 19 than they ever are. 
Like, yeah. And we got to make sure that they don't hang out with their families or go dancing. Like, that's just off limits. And you can drink, but you have to buy the alcohol in a different town because we can't show them that we drink. We have to drink in secret. Like, yeah. what? There are so <laughs> many Let's... weird cultural things that happen, especially in South America, where it's like trying to do this hostile takeover and destroy someone else's culture and structure of doing things. Like, no, we don't do that in the United States as Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, it's brutal. Yeah. What I what I found after like I just gave you know, some brief examples that of things I didn't like. Um, I also I also had a lot of fun with those people. They were like super fun. I mean, okay, another fun fact is every single person there. I've not yet met. I had not yet in the whole time there. I'd never met someone who had lived there for more than a few months who wasn't robbed at gunpoint through their house window oh. by some like. <laughs> vigilante gang or like some individual who knew where they were and like there were times where we were like scouting someone stole someone's motorcycle and we were like mm -hmm. and someone stole someone's surfboards so we were like driving up and down to little beach towns trying to find locals who had robbed us and like taking photographs of people like like private investigators trying to track down <laughs> local thieves like it was a pretty there's a lot of crime yeah but at the same time it was like you have 18 year olds from 20 different countries or five, mm -hmm. 10 different countries, whatever, um, who have more wealth than like the entire town and they're flaunting the shit out of it yeah. by like, oh, I have my, I have two kayaks and mm -hmm. I have an awesome flat screen TV before that existed. You're like the yeah. newest TV and they have every new laptop and the newest like, special clothes and they travel and they fly places all the time. They're mm -hmm. always on vacation and they've never worked a moment yeah. for months or years. And of course, these people are like, oh, get those rich assholes out of here. Yeah. And, oh, and then they're also elders and they're like 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And there's like locals who have been, you know, working their ass off, cut off all their family, lo lost their culture and their friendships and their family for a decade who don't have any like, I don't even want to say the word, like special arrangements. Privileges. You know, you want to say uh, privileges. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for filling the blank. <laughs> yeah. So it was a very strange thing. And I kind of found it to be some kind of imperialism or like cultural colonialism it absolutely is and i thought it was disgusting yeah like that part of it so that that was like my last straw so i went back to the state i went to seattle after that and i was just like i don't care mm -hmm. i'll go to the church but i'm not i'm not taking it that seriously and then i got in trouble for like defending someone's sexuality mm -hmm. which was a heterosexual man who everyone as soon as he was not in the room would be like did you see how he was sitting he was sitting so gay and oh, I was like, yo, I'm a manager at this company. And I was like 12 witnesses there. And I stood up and I was like, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you guys gay bashing someone who's not gay. Yeah. It's, it's not even okay if he is gay. Like, it doesn't matter. And, and they were so mad that they turned me into the elders for being possibly gay. And oh, I was like, I've been there. I've been the there elders? myself, brother. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. This is a special, like, judicial moment. Like, you guys got to talk to me about possibly being gay because I defended someone destroying someone's reputation. A whole group of people destroying someone's reputation who just walked out of the room. What was sort of the next steps after you were disillusioned? You weren't interested in necessarily being, like, an active witness. Where did the transition from not taking it seriously go to, well, now I want to fully be out, out? I started... When I was in Ecuador, I got this phone call or an email. It's like, call me on some pay phone. And I, it was this woman I'd met in Colorado who's a witness. Grew up in it, all families in it, like nothing, no culture outside of it. She, start, she and I started long distance dating. So she'd fly in from Colorado to Seattle, and then I would fly there every, like once a month for like five days, and we would try not to break the rules. <laughs> and then I moved to Colorado, and we would try not to break the rules, and then... I was in, I just was like, I'm going to go in the Spanish congregation. It's like way more interesting to me. I did that for a while, but I wasn't like that close to anybody. But it was nice to like have a break from her weird English congregation because a bunch of weirdos in her spot. Hmm. And then we were getting closer and closer. And it was like a really like amazing thing that was happening. And then I, I got really sick. And in that time I was really sick. Like something happened where like an elder called me. He's like, I have noticed you weren't at the meetings for like two meetings. Uh, you have something to say for yourself? And I was like, wow. I'm like, I can barely move my body. Damn. I'm so deathly ill from like a kidney infection. Damn. And I feel like I'm going to die every day. And I was like, that was... he's like, oh, sorry to hear that. Well, hope to see you at the meeting soon. Bye. And it was like, oh, that's like so unloving. And like, 
no empathy at all. Like he just like tra- all of you to trash talk me, and then so I was like, you know what, fuck this guy. I'm gonna actually now I'm giving myself the permission to Google search some things I've been wondering about. Oh boy. And that thing that Eric in Minneapolis had like put in my head, and he got me reading a couple books, um, which I'd read. I started reading um, Sam Harris's The End of Faith, which is a spiritual atheist, mm-hmm. but like very outspoken atheist. Part of the four, the horseman, four, what was it? One of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the atheist apocalypse or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Dawkins, um, Sam Harris, Hitchens. Yeah. I loved it. All those guys are great and were influential to me. Mm-hmm. And I read, I actually had read already Dawkins' book, God Delusion, before I went to Ecuador. Oh, really? So like, okay. And there's a whole chapter in there about Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know if anyone knows that, but God Delusion has a whole book about the creation, the creation book. Is there a creator who cares about you? Which is like mm-hmm. their answer to evolution. And it's like the same. He goes in and breaks down like every chapter, every argument. And he's like, it's always saying the exact same thing. If it's beautiful, God made it. 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 And like no reason at all. Completely logical fallacies everywhere, every which way. Misquotes. I, and, I actually uh, read that book when I was a witness too because Watchtower cool. quoted it. And when I saw go. Watchtower yeah. quoted it, anytime Watchtower quoted a book, I would just buy it and read the whole thing. I did a lot of that. I read a lot of people they quoted in the wake or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really, really helpful. Like those are all just parts of the path, right? Like little chinks in the armor. Mm-hmm. Like they just gave you this out to like go read that. They read it. Why can't I read it? Exactly. They're quoting it. He must be putting, they're putting him on a pedestal <laughs> around the world to all of us. Um, Pro tip to, to all you uh, Pimo witnesses out there. If Watchtower yeah. quotes from it, you can quote from it too. See what your family thinks about the context of that, <laughs> of their quotation. That quote. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty astounding. Not only just the... Not only just read the author, read just that quote and the paragraphs around it or the argument around that quote. Mm-hmm. It's almost always twisted by the Watchtower. Yeah. So I started Googling stuff that had been in my head that I wanted to know the answers to, that the Watchtower had no answers to. And I'd read everything they had said about those questions. And there was no, like, even elders couldn't talk about those questions. I'd asked, like, I'd asked the Koala Bear question. And I've got the best answer I got from elders was, well, God can do anything. Like, yeah, but what did he do? Like, oh, he poofed the koala bears to Australia. Like, okay, so God's m- using magic? Like, poof. like there's a cloud of smoke, and the koala bears, like, all of a sudden, like, awesome, eucalyptus. I needed that. <laughs> An angel farted <laughs> one day, and boom, koala bears. <laughs> Yeehaw. Like, is that all the deep you're going to go? He's like, well, I looked in the Washer Library, and I didn't find any answers. Like, yeah, me either. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm asking you guys. Like, can, is there any other options we have? And like, no, we have to just believe it. Um, so that was unsatisfying, so... I was like Googling, all right, proof of the flood. Oh, boy. And the only people I could find was young earth creationists, like Christians wearing white lab coats pretending to be scientists. Scientists don't wear white lab coats. That's, those are doctors. I don't know. <laughs> I was just like, this doesn't even make any sense. This guy's clearly not uh, anything to do with science. He's trying to tell us Christian apologist ideas about proof of the flood using really illogical understanding of archaeology. And it's really embarrassing because if the closest thing that Jehovah's Witnesses have to a similar idea is young earth creationism, it's about the dumbest set of ideas I've ever come across on the internet. <laughs> and they make and fun of young people. earth creationists as well. Jehovah's Witnesses, like in their literature, they're like, how ridiculous is it that someone would believe that the earth is 6,000 years old? But also, Noah's flood absolutely happened. Right, at exactly that time. Or exactly 4,500 years ago, like the Bible says. Yeah. It's like, well, you're don't, basically saying the exact same thing, except like the rocks are older. Don't you like, know that there the was important... a, 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 a scallop found on the top of Mount Everest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that mountain was under the ocean millions of years ago went during another phase of life. Well, where do you think the Grand Canyon came from? Obviously. <laughs> yeah, water must have... They wrote it. Just very, very river. specifically <laughs> there, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, so I, I went to the next meeting after I got, after I was healed, mm-hmm. and I'd read all this stuff for like days, and I was like down this crazy rabbit hole. Like my entire, like all the things I always sort of, I just put up a, I just held, I withheld my disbelief, yeah. if you will, for a decade mm-hmm. of biology class and reading science and physics and things about whatever history that were like con- completely contradict in every meaningful way anything the washer ever wrote mm-hmm. and like well they're all wrong and like these dudes in new york are right but they're not even right they're not even like proud enough about it to put their name on it like some anonymous person in the building wrote it um anyway so i went into this meeting and then like the next talk was by this ministerial servant 
on some like midweek talk and he was just he was gay bashing from the wow. stage and i was like this is so fucked like and i like had this moment where i like like that's i don't agree with that at all that is so just evil and unloving towards this huge population and there's certainly people that in this room that might be gay and are in every congregation i've ever been in who certainly were gay or like closeted or who knows like whatever like it's a thing that happens everywhere in every part of society like why are they so hateful toward this one group of humanity mm -hmm. and i just like I looked around and I remembered this like one sister, not in that Spanish hall, but the English that goes to the same place this is in Colorado. And she had said, God's gonna lightning strike the gays. I can't wait for that day. What? Like, what? Like that's so fucked, like so evil. Like you're such an evil person that you want God to smote out these people that you don't like, or you, you somehow have been yeah. taught to hate. That is terrifying. And, like that people walk I just, around like, with this vision of like, a lightning bolt coming down for the gaze and then just these like boots sitting there like Looney Tunes style, just like steaming. Right. And she thinks that's reality and is like praying for it. That is She's so like, cooked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excited. So gross. So I just like looked around at everyone in the room and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> They're all like, I'm surrounded by crazy cult members. And I just had this like weird, like, anxiety rise to my whole body mm -hmm. and i was like i need to get out of here and never go back like Gollum says <laughs> <laughs> leave now and never come back <laughs> classic classic that is so funny that's exactly what and happened I, to me too yeah yeah you were saying when we talked the other day so so interesting it's like and i got up and i in the middle of the meeting and i was like just like Ugh, like gross feeling. I had to get out of that place. And I got out and I literally never went back to a kingdom hall or Jehovah's Witness church. Mm -hmm. So what uh, motivated you <laughs> then to become sort of like active within like the outspoken ex Jehovah's Witness community? What was that sort of transition? A couple of years later, I was so tired of people. If I told anyone about my background, mm -hmm. Like, okay, so leaving the religion, that was, like, a relief for me. Yeah. Like, the religion was always a really hard thing to, like, interact with for me. Like, a lot of challenging stuff, a lot of gaslighting and, like, bizarre, abusive language and misdirection and illogical nonsense and, like, cult programming. It's just, like, it was just a lot, and I was, like, aware of some of it, and I didn't like it. Where, like, going back to the real world was, like, Oh, I have like all my time back again and like I can do what I want. I, I, went, I started being in a band again. And so it was like, a huge relief, but I would still, whenever I told someone about my background, they are, it, whatever I said, no matter how many minutes, hours or words I used or detailed descriptions I gave of any situation, they would try to sum up what they thought of this new revelation or this new knowledge of me into their strange framework of what a cult is like or like what a religious background or like an abusive background is or a high control background is whatever that thing is and i wasn't even that aware of what it was but like every time you would see the switch go on and someone like oh you're one of those and now you're otherized okay so you're we're not we can't just be friends and equals anymore now you're this like other thing mm -hmm. that i'm going to tell my friends about when i introduce you to people when you're not around yeah and then they would you know then they're using their version like oh scott was grew up in this weird religion mm -hmm. or he was a jehovah's witness you know what that's like they're like the birthday people or you know whatever the thing is that they're going to say to summarize you and i'm like okay so now i'm other i was otherized as witnesses as uh, uh, their terminology bad association or like not not worthy to be invited or like not good person to have around or not spiritual enough mm -hmm. and I, like my world my high school friends would be like oh he's you know this kind of person so like my whole life i'm in like two different worlds that neither 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 accept me as an equal mm -hmm. and i'm like outed of some situations because of some background or some thing and then so i leave the thing and i'm like so proud it's like oh my god the most important thing i've ever done with my life might be just leaving this religion mm -hmm. and i'm so so happy i did that I would love to shout it from the rooftops, but as soon as I tell anyone at all, even the tiniest piece of it, they use it in a way that's like against me. And like, I was like, you know what? The best thing to do is just never tell anyone about it, mm -hmm. which 
was strange because I went lived for like four years not saying anything about it until I started like dating someone and then we were like close. And I would reveal it, mm -hmm. and and then it would be like, oh, like that's so. That's that's so weird. I don't know anything about that or like. It, it's it a weird just, experience. Go back in this otherizing thing. Yeah, where I'm a, I'm an outsider again. Yeah, and, and you have this thing that's a fundamental part of you. It's like it's something that you were. It was like the foundation of your kind of life. Always evolves around being a Jehovah's Witness, and yet you just yeah. have to like sort of be quiet about it because people right. just look at you like, "Are you okay?" Like, you just right. left a religion. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, and I didn't really know how to handle it because it never really went very well. Mm -hmm. And then I was I was in Vietnam, so I moved to Vietnam with this goal of like getting back into filmmaking because like our high school I didn't talk about that I talked about music, but like in our high school we had like an awesome documentary and photography program, and I went to school for photography and video and stuff, and I loved it, and I kind of want to get back to that. And um, I went there with the goal of working for some nonprofit mm -hmm. organization and like working on something meaningful <clears throat> to me. I did that. And then I started working with some pretty high-end filmmakers from the States. Mm -hmm. And I pitched to them. I was like, you know, I've got this like kind of crazy story from my background. I'd like to tell it somehow. And I think I've now got some skills. I'm just developing the skills to like maybe get there someday. And they gave me some advice. And I kinda, that kind of got the wheels turning. Like I'm hanging with professionals. They're, I'm learning a ton from them. And it's awesome. And I love it. But now I, I want to use that for something that tells my story. Because I never, anytime I've heard, seen my story told in film, it's usually depressing mm -hmm. and like exploitive of the emotions of the person's trauma. Yeah. And then they roll credits and I don't like that. Yeah. I think it's, I'm not proud. I'm all the movies that are about the religion. It's like still makes me seem like I'm from a very weird place. I am, Yeah. but there's, I'm also proud of who I am and like, I'm proud of the places I wa I came from and I'm also really proud of the experiences I had and like, excite, like it's who it makes me who I am. I would love to be able to point to some media like any minority and say like, that person's fucking cool. Yeah. And like, that's not possible with the Jehovah's Witnesses. All the, all the videos are like, that person's fucking broken. Yeah. Fuck, that sucks. Changing the narrative is super important to like growth and healing and like, okay, this thing happened to me. What's next? You know, where am I going? And focusing on the, the positive aspects of, well, look at all of the things that I've, I've learned from this experience and look at this beautiful yeah. human that I am. And, you know, yeah. showcasing that can be super powerful, which, I mean, I think there's a place for both types of interaction with the media, right? Of, you know, we need mm -hmm. to tell the stories and need to tell, like, what it's actually like being a Jehovah's Witness, because it is sad and depressing, but there needs to be yeah. more balance. And I think... I'm not saying it's yeah. a bad form of media. I'm just yeah, saying yeah, yeah. I'm, I would like to make something that doesn't exist. Yes. And, at all. And it's... I'm totally about that. Like, let's let's... Yeah move on a little bit like let's let's progress exactly instead of just that's the right terminology re regurgitating or not regurgitating but like continuing to do the same thing over and over and over again like let's make something yeah. fresh and new and exciting yeah and i have and when we did the crowdfund for the film i really pitched this idea that i had started developing which is oh so I, okay so i started making a in germany and in oregon mm -hmm. and in vietnam i filmed with three different people in the first few sessions of trying this out. I interviewed people and I wanted to show, let them tell their life story, their coming out story. And I wanted to frame it in like the LGBT language, like, because it is so similar mm -hmm. to like leaving this worldview is similar. And like the, the ramifications are similar too. Like when you walk away from this, you're walk, you're actually, there's almost certainly going to lose relationships with people that you really care about. And it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. They're forced to do it because they're trapped in the mentality of it, they're trapped in the programming of it, they're trapped in the cult. And they're coerced to do it, and it's not actually their choice. They're f coerced through undue influence, mm -hmm. through social and emotional manipulation, which is, like, they're they're strapped. Yeah, like, there's not a lot more, there's, they're victims, yeah. They're the true victims. Like, people that got out, like, yeah, we have things that we don't like that suck, and you could call us victims, but like, people that are inside are the biggest victims, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And so I wanted to do something on that. So I was making these videos and interviewing people and kind of like getting my feet wet in and like t testing the waters and trying it and seeing what worked. And I've never really done, I've done, interviewed a lot of people, but never for a project like deep and meaningful like this. Mm -hmm. And I realized I wanted to do, the whole project was sort of like, oh, where did you land? You got this, you took this amazing freedom, made all these, which had all these sacrifices as a part of it, but like 
totally untethered, disconnected. You had all these options. And what I kept finding was everywhere I traveled in the world, and I, you know, living abroad in Vietnam, I kept running into ex-witnesses there. Mm -hmm. Just travelers. And like, oh, we lived together for five months. You didn't tell me you were an ex-witness. I'm an ex-witness. Like, holy shit, that's amazing. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Like, oh, I, I know. Yeah, like that kept happening to me. Like I even dated an ex-witness for months. We never talked about it. A year later, like after we, you know, it was just like a casual thing. And like a year later, she called me. She's like, oh, my mom died. I want to talk to you for some reason. And she, she's part of this weird religion. And she told me this whole thing. And I was like, no way. Like you grew up as a witness. That's crazy. Like we've been, we dated. It's funny like, how you how learn how quickly about. to not talk about being a witness, like in the real world, because yeah. no one gets it. So you just don't talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so I kept, I kept happening and I was like, okay, I really, do, I really keep loving this thing keeps happening. I really love that people have like gone and made this whole other life. Mm -hmm. Like it's inspiring to me. And it's like, it feels really amazing to like reconnect with someone who's also taken that huge leap and gone and done something interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, what did you do with all the infinite possibilities? And I want to do this like kind of more moving on, as you said, um, view and show people who've like really landed somewhere. Like we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to have healed. We'll all take different paths and grow in different ways. But like people do some pretty substantial things mm -hmm. with their freedom. And some people talk about the topic and some people never do. But like you, we all grow. And that's what the film has a really big element that was important to me is that there's there's a dramatic arc and a climax, mm -hmm. emotional climax, but there's also a like a big deep breath, like like exhale, like okay, like that was a lot. Then what happened? And then we get to see what happened, and like all this kind of like philo philosophy and like calmness and like you know where they sort of feel and are at as adults and mm -hmm. show their modern life in a way. And also, following artists makes it really interesting because they were making music from the inception of their teenage lives all the way oh, yeah. through their transitions and made albums about their leaving the Jehovah's Witness experience. One, one of the guys has, he's like, you listen to this album, this album, this album. That's my leaving the Jehovah's Witness experience as part of the movie. And you can listen to his albums and they're on Spotify. And it's like, he's, it's really interesting. And, and there's a couple other people that have these transition albums. And since I've met a lot of other artists who've done a similar thing, like they're coming out albums essentially. And then now they've made art beyond that. That's like, now I'm just a human being who's like grown and I have a life outside of it make other art about things I care about that are totally unrelated to this topic of this transition and this trauma. And it's amazing to see it and hear it and feel it. Yeah. And I think it's important that, you know, there's more variety and stuff like that. So I'm happy that you like went out and had a different vision. Like you wanted this thing to be about obviously the recognition of the pain, but that I like that exhale, you know, cause that's, that is the moment, you know, when you wake up and then you finally like, <sighs> I don't have to do this anymore. It doesn't have to affect me anymore. I can just go on and do amazing, incredible things. So I think yeah. having more sort of things out there in the world, hopefully, will help people to see that they can exhale and move on mm -hmm. and be amazing people. Because sometimes you, what's the old uh, Isaac Newton? You got to stand on the shoulders of giants sometimes. So right. I think just having those stories out there. So um, how can people find your documentary film? So it is now, I'm proud to say, it's been a long road, but I'm proud to say it's, oh, it's available. It's on my Patreon. So it's patreon.com witness underground. And if you want to learn more about it, you can learn more about it there, but the, probably the best place right now is witnessunderground.com. Okay. And so we have like the podcast, the background story, all the artists, all the album art. You can listen to like 20 different albums there for free. Um, there's an archive of music from Jehovah's Witnesses and there's a bunch of stuff from ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and a lot of the same people. And that's growing, like I'm meeting ex-Witnesses and who have been making amazing music that are unrelated to and sometimes very related to the the, the coming out experience. So and, I'll put a um, link to like that pop artists. in the uh, description as well, just so that way people can find it easily. But maybe now we should actually yeah. play a, uh, I think you have a trailer for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we'll just play that now. I do. Nuclear Gopher was a record label and online community of Jehovah's Witnesses who all did indie music. I want to hold you tightly. 
it just blew up, but it all stayed in these weird little bounds. Witnesses can listen to music. It's not like a footloose situation where like the preacher's like, no music ever, but stuff is frowned upon. You need to really beware of that disco beat because that disco beat invites the demons. This is not inviting the demons, it's Lionel Richie. They think that any moment now, God is going to destroy the world. At 17, I basically thought to myself, what am I doing? Is this how I want to live my life? Like, do I even believe this? If they just treated people all right and had some kooky beliefs, I could totally live with it. But friends who committed suicide because they're gay and they're a witness, everything just changed. Music was my savior at that point. The moment people started taking it seriously is the moment that someone would start to, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. We start talking and she's like, well, so if we split up, would you still be a witness? What I actually said was, no, I don't believe any of it anymore. And I never saw her again. Your wife? Yeah, I never physically saw her again. It was an orphan, he this Nuclear Gopher was very special. It created a space for people to be eccentric and creative and also as healthy as you could be in that culture. And while it lasted, it was like the best. What are some of the other projects that you're kind of working on moving forward? So the most important thing I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about for what I'm creating right now is the Witness Underground podcast. So when we did the film festival run in 2021, mm -hmm. we also started a podcast. Uh, the main guy, one of the main guys in the film and a couple others popped on from the film. And we just talked about what was happening and like, oh, we're in this city. Oh, we're in that city. Oh, check out the film here and you can watch it now. And it was a huge run. And of course, we didn't reach everybody in the next show. It was in this community. But it was a really fun, like going, like taking a band on tour, like taking your art on tour, yeah. showing it to an audience in like the perfect scenario in a huge theater with great sound, yeah. and then having a Q and A after. So, yeah. um, we're doing that as well. So I have the podcast that the podcast started then, and we're carrying it on and like ramping it up. So like, thought more of that. A lot more artists who've left the religion, mm -hmm. and there's quite a few. Like, imagine I'm gonna try to get a lot of people on, but so far I've got this psych rock artist I mentioned earlier, this pop artist from LA. And uh, I have quite a few in on deck, which is exciting for all different kinds of genres: yeah. folk, pop, rock. Um, and one of the one of the big things that's unique about the project is Patreon is a way to support me as an artist, mm -hmm. keep it going. So there's there's money involved, but I want people to like don't compare it to you can you should compare it like think about your finances, but like maybe you watch a film for five dollars or you go to a theater for fifteen. Yeah. Um, this movie right now it's available for 10, but I want to give five X the value of that $10. Mm -hmm. So I have another film I made about my, the music scene in Vietnam and I live there. Like I was deeply embedded in the music scene there. We made a film about this music venue and we show like 10 different genres, full six, six full length music videos. And it's like a very international music scene. It's like my first, like my student film mm -hmm. essentially or witness undergrounds on my first big feature that I'm took really seriously. Mm -hmm. So those are both available podcast. Uh, the blog is happening. It's going to be ramping up huge. We're doing like community patron calls okay. every month, couple, one or two a month. And what's cool about this month is if you join the Patreon, of course, you can watch the film. If you join any level, we're going to be doing, and this is to anyone who also crowdfunded the film five years ago, mm -hmm. it's all crowdfunded by like 240 ex Jobs Witnesses. Oh, wow. So like we made $11,000 to make the movie. Oh, nice. So the people that did that, if you're listening to this, come on. Well, I'll, I'll send you an email. We're going to do a watch party. So it's going to run like a film festival. So it's this really cool app that I'm using where we can stream the movie live. Mm -hmm. And then we all sit in like beach chairs and little virtual, like it's like a zoom room, but it's like really elaborate. Yeah, that's and cute. Uh, you can ask your questions and we can all hang out for infinite amount of time and talk. I did it with once with the Jewish community mm -hmm. in New York, Friedem.org. And we talked, they wanted, they did a Q and a for eight hours. Oh. I was there for it. It was amazing. That's great. It was yeah. so insightful. So we're doing that this month. Okay. Like a bunch of times, three or four times probably. So a and little then, bit of bang for your buck. Yeah. <laughs> As you yeah. said, you're not just offering like, hey, support this upcoming project or something, but like the content's yeah. already there and you have mm -hmm. other further content that you're working on as well. So go uh, check out his Patreon, go check out his documentary, all of that good stuff. Um, any closing words that you would like to give to the fine people of the internet? I got one more bullet point. Okay. And that's the big... The big change I want to make and see besides everything we've already talked about, like supporting artists, 
there's one more way to support artists that I want to, st I'm starting, mm -hmm. which is a grant, an art, XGW grant, artist grant, XGW artist grant. And basically this is how it works. 20% of all money that comes into Patreon gets put into a fund mm -hmm. that will then be put into a kind of grant contest, like pitch your idea. Mm -hmm. And then the people in the film and maybe a couple of the artists we bring on will vote on that art idea. Yeah. And then we'll grant that money. Like right now it's a thousand dollars. So if you're an artist or you want to do something creative, you want to try doing something creative, pitch your idea on the website. Mm -hmm. So that's a new, new thing. But yeah, I, I, it's a deeply meaningful film to me. And I think anyone in the XGW world is going to absolutely love it for how refreshing it is mm -hmm. and relatable it is. And it's something that I think would reach Jehovah's Witnesses as well. But ultimately it's catered to the general public because it's kind of, so we want to bring awareness to this religion yeah. in a unique way, but it's also like watching a musical. It's like super entertaining because there's all different kinds of genres. There's 42 songs. There's not, there's like two moments in the film without music and it's all soundtracked by witnesses and ex-witnesses. And it was a huge community project. Um, so it's, it's like my big life's work. Yeah. I hope that I have future life's works <laughs> that are this important to me. But this one is like, I spent five years slogging away at this thing and it's been a huge learning curve and it's been awesome. And I would love to share that with you. Yeah. Whether that, whether that's on the Patreon or you come onto a watch party or like somehow, I don't know, however you get on, I don't care, watch it. And I want your feedback and I want you to share it with people. But thanks again. Yeah. For like bringing me on and, and like exposing this awesome thing that I created. Like, I feel like it's awesome. Anyway, <laughs> this thing I created, that I'm in love with, I want to share with everybody and they spread it around and all the artists on the inside are like deeply involved in its creation. It's like their life story, mm -hmm. not mine. And they're so excited for it to be out finally. Yeah. Well, I mean the, one of the goals of 2023 for the JW thoughts channel was to try and showcase and highlight more people that were doing stuff. Maybe that, uh, other wit ex Jehovah's Witnesses weren't aware of because there are a lot of people doing some pretty amazing projects. I really like the idea of having like an ex Jehovah's Witness art grant. I think that is a super, super wholesome way to give back, you know, recognizing that, yeah. hey, okay, we're getting something from it, but we're also getting back. So yeah, I just, I really, yeah. I really vibe with that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for putting in the hard work and coming on the channel. Very much appreciate it. But uh, yeah, go check out the Patreon, all of that good stuff. I guess, uh, yeah, I'll just say, stay safe, be kind, and don't forget to smile, and you better have a good-ass day.